Hello, YouTubers. Today's episode is brought to you by Ancestral Supplements. These guys are doing some amazing things that I think are very pertinent in times like this. I'm going to read a little bit right off the label here. The modern world has left us malnourished with an epidemic of declining health. Sound familiar? The solution is to find ways to recreate our ancestral environment, sleep, nourishment, movement, sunshine, etc. It's time we honor our ancestors by putting back in what the modern world has left out to return our people back to strength, health, and happiness. And you can get a one-of-a-kind guided experience at ancestralsupplements.com. If you don't know where to start, right here, beef organs. It's got everything you need from liver, heart, kidney, pancreas, and spleen. And we've got a number of other products here that are all designed to help you thrive in any time, but especially in times like this. This one, colostrum, is absolutely phenomenal. Male optimization formula, adrenals I've been taking to wean myself off the amount of caffeine that I used to consume. All sorts of good stuff here that supports the immune system and the body and mind. And you can get 10% off everything in the store using code word KING10 at checkout. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. All right, officially, we get to start now. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Mark Jang is in the house. Thank you, sir. Honored to be here. Hell yeah. So you're in town in Austin. This is your fourth rendition of the K3? Yes, yes. We did, uh, we did a closed group to begin with, and we did uh, one in L.A., uh that we did new york and then now here in austin it's been amazing yeah awesome brother well let's let's unpack some of that talk about your life growing up um what was your family like where'd you grow up and then get into your training who you train with all that good stuff and then developing these systems right on right on um i'm from delaware um i know it's one of those funny things where it's like wow Asian kid, Chinese kid from Delaware, like not exactly a hot spot for Asians. Um, but yeah, born and raised in Delaware. Um, my parents emigrated there because they were able to find jobs with the state. Um, so grew up there, um, actually notably, and attended the uh, high school where they shot Dead Poet Society. Oh, Probably one cool. of those movies that a lot of folks kind of dig. Um, and actually Robin Williams was there shooting that. That was my junior year, I think, end of my junior year. So it was a really cool experience to get a peek into how Hollywood works. Um, graduated from there, came out to L.A. Um, and started off at Caltech and then transferred to UCLA. Um, and so in L.A., of course, L.A. being one of those meccas for martial arts training. Um, I was lucky enough to train with kind of some of the who's who um, from Shotokan Karate's uh, Tsutomu Oshima, who was the guy that translated the Karate do Kyohan. It's like the Bible of Shotokan Karate. Um, Trained with former Bruce Lee student Daniel Lee in Tai Chi, Wing Chun, and some JKD. Uh, Shaolin Masters, um, Sui Jiao, which is one of my great loves, Chinese wrestling. Um, and then up till now, um, I spend a lot of my time training at the Inasano Academy under Bruce Lee's probably most notable student, Dan Inasano. Awesome, brother. So it's been a wild ride. I mean, from a kid in a, in a semi-rural environment, like... Just thinking, man, how great it would be to just meet some of these folks to then actually, you know, training with them regularly, like having them text me. Like, for example, um, Guru Inasano, when I was um, in Korea one time and I was really homesick, he messaged me. He I messaged me uh, like a video clip of him training my son. And it was like, oh, my God, I was just like totally bowled over. Yeah, that's so incredible. And for people who don't know, uh, I had some experience with Jeet Kune Do when I first got into mixed martial arts. It's really like you could call it the first mixed martial art. You could call it really where, you know, Bruce Lee had taken a conglomerate of everything he thought that was good. And, and his philosophy was, why just use one? Why do we have to do that? But that was kind of the old construction of how martial arts were practiced. You know, totally. my wushu is better than your wushu. And you have like all these different styles that you, and you even uh, kind of like the kumite in blood sport. Right. You know, you've got Muay Thai versus the the monkey guy from, from right, 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 right. spinning around and on his hands and feet um that kind of was the style of fighting and he got in a lot of a lot a lot of heat and a lot of flack from the old school regime in wanting to combine those martial arts but you could see that seed a new way of what martial arts can be yeah I, you know a lot of people think of jkd or jeet kune do as the as like the first mixed martial art and like i th I kind of think about it as the first modern mixed martial art. Mm. You know, he was looking at stuff that was outside of just the classical. So, you know, modern boxing, fencing, weight training, all of these other influences that 
maybe he would not have been so privy to if he just stayed in Asia. But as an Asian American, he had a different lens through which to view the world, which is really dope. You know, like if you look at styles like Shotokan, for example, everyone's heard of Shotokan that's done martial arts. Like Shotokan is considered a classical martial art, but that's already a mix. It's already a hybrid of two different styles of karate. Shorinu and Shoreiru, like Judo also, like Judo as, as a martial art. A lot of people think about that as like one monolithic martial art, but it's several styles of jujitsu that Kano, Professor Kano, amalgamated and reclassified um, in terms of categorization of techniques to make his soft way, his judo. So, it, it, you know, mixed martial art per se isn't something so new, but to take it outside of that limitation of just other classical arts and other arts from different countries is something really special. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, so talk about the development of K3. You said that you had been working on this for years and prompted by your homie and partner uh, even longer to start yes. developing this and to get it out to the masses. Yes. So around 2008-ish or so, I, you know, I, prior to that, I'd been teaching kettle, or I'd been training with kettlebells um, for quite some time. I've had the you know really unique opportunity to spend a lot of time training privately and semi privately with Pavel Tsulin, um, who's like pretty much the godfather, the dude, the dude, <laughs> yeah. totally the dude. I mean, I think were it, I don't think I'm sure. There's no doubt in my mind. Were it not for his efforts, kettlebells would still be a fringe tool that would be used maybe by some strongmen clubs or like you know Eastern European countries, but not something that would be as ubiquitous as it is here now. Um, and I've had a, a lot of time, luckily, with Pavel directly. And so, um, and I think that started in like 04. So then in 06, I, you know, I, I went and I took his instructorship course, you know, past that. and then RKC? The RKC back in the day. Um, and then went through that and then started teaching. And then, you know, luckily uh, had the good fortune to rise through the ranks. So around 2008, after traveling for a little bit and then being known for both martial arts since I, by that time I'd already been serving as a contributing editor for black belt magazine. Um, and then, you know, teaching for RKC and some other stuff. Um, and then also, you know, occasionally authoring an article or something like that in, in regards to Chinese medicine or wellness. So people kind of knew me through those different venues and they say, say like, Hey doc, what is it that you do? What's your workout? Like, what is it? What does your training consist of? If you were doing like an ideal training, what's doc's perfect day of training? Like, and I thought about it. I'm like, hmm, well, obviously kettlebells is part of it. And then some kung fu, karate, whatever, some kick punch stuff, some kickboxing, kick calisthenic type thing, right? So it's martial. There's a tactical aspect to it, but it's, it's empty hand. And then the third K that I thought of was like, ah, Kali and Kabi Kabong, Thai martial arts, Thai weaponry martial arts. And so I thought, wow, that's three Ks, K3. And so I was like, oh, that's a cool moniker, K3 Combat Movement Systems. And so we ran with that. Um, over time, what was interesting is that like, I thought, man, all of these things are so dope. I love doing them. But the people that want to come and train and, and learn these things for the reasons of wanting to learn a martial skill or a combative skill are a very thin slice of society. Could we take these drills? Could we take these practices? Could we take these insights and expand them to serve people in the rehab world? Could we expand this to serve people in the professional sports world? Could we expand this to team building? Could we expand this to like helping kids with re learning disorders? And the answer was an unequivocal yes. Yeah, that's incredible. And I only I got to show up to the last, I think, hour, hour and a half of the seminar last uh, yesterday, which was mostly working on the Kali. And uh, it's funny because, I, you know, reading about your background and I've followed you for a while, I was like, damn, dude, because Pavel's had that kind of influence on me. Mm -hmm. you know, I've read several of his books, Relaxing to Stretch, Easy Strength that he did with Dan John is one of my all-time favorites. And um, something that I do before every single workout, and this is a little off topic, but every single workout, no matter if it's a, a, a slow nasal breathing only run, or I'm using the concept two gear, or if I'm in a power lift, or even just do, do a bag workout, I always do three simple movements with the kettlebell. I do bootstrap squats, halos, and windmills. 
And Steve Maxwell, when he went through the RKC certification, Dan John had already been certified. And that was the question that he asked Steve Maxwell. He said, what are the best three kettlebell movements for mobility? And Steve Maxwell, who's an older guy and definitely put well, you know, he's well put together and still doing it all. He was like, I do these three before I do anything. And that has greatly improved uh, my ability to not get injured, to be warm, to prime the nervous system before I work out. And I think about how simple that is, you know, like one of the beautiful things about the kettlebell is that you can have one singular piece of equipment, take it with you anywhere, keep it in your trunk. You can work out with it right outside of your, of your office on your lunch break. You can do anything with it. You can do use it to open the body. You can use it for a lot of things. And, um, and it doesn't even have to weigh that much. You know, I remember in one of Pavel's books, he talked about working out at the, uh, he got tested at, uh, the Sports Science Science Institute, something like that. Uh, Waterloo, I want to say. Yeah, probably in, Professor McGill's lab. Yeah, up in Canada. And um, he had a standard 53 or 54-pound kettlebell, 24 kilo. Mm-hmm. And he was hiking it so hard in between his legs that when they measured the um, the poundage underneath his feet on this plate, they were, they were going 10x. So it was 500 pounds of force that he was generating. So his nervous system recognized 500 pounds of load while he was only holding a 24 kilo kettlebell, yeah. right? Like that's bananas. When you think like, Oh, you can get the technique that like that. And you don't actually have to deadlift 500 pounds. And yet he's moving that amount of weight in motion. Right. And I think of that too. Like when you, when you train for different sports, you're training, usually with a purpose, but people have this idea from, and this is a conversation I have with our buddy, Jay Ferugia, like most people who get into fitness or strength training came from the eighties background of muscle and fitness and muscle mag international and flex magazine and that kind of shit. And it's all bodybuilding, but that's not how you train for sport. You train dynamically and kettlebells are as dynamic as they get. Absolutely. You know, Pavel actually turned so much of my understanding of both, I mean, not just training in terms of like strength training, but also clinical medicine really on its ear. I mean, if with Pavel, it's funny how we met. Guru Dan, Dan Inasano actually called me up one time. He's like, Doc, I need a favor. I'm like, sure. What is it, sir? He goes, um, can you come by the school? Come, can you come by the academy? I'm like, sure. What's up? He goes, well, I need you to come by at this date and this time because like one of my students got me these private lessons with this Russian weightlifting coach. And like, you finally gotten my lower back to feel better. Like I would, it would be awesome if you could be like the medical voice in the room so that if this coach asks me to do something that's dangerous or I get hurt, you can either like object on my behalf or you can like put me back together. I'm like, sure, I'll be there. No problem. Who's the Russian weightlifting coach? Pavel Tsitsulin. So I'm like, it was one of those moments like, holy shit. Um, And as I'm listening, this is my first time actually seeing kettlebells in person, right? Never mind Pavel. And so as I'm listening to Pavel talk, as I'm watching him explain these concepts, I'm like, the one concept that keeps coming through my head is like, shit, why aren't we taught this in terms of like, not only physical education as kids, but certainly as medical professionals. Every single person that takes an anatomy course, every single person that's like either a trainer or some sort of wellness professional needs to know this shit. Like this is totally contrary to, or like left fieldish to some of the stuff that we're taught. Some of his concepts like change of activity is a form of rest. Leave two quality reps in the bank. Don't train to failure. It's like, uh, you know, everything I'd been hearing about training prior to that was go hard or go home. You know, sweat is fat crying. Like, you know, you're... you're sweat is fat crying. <laughs> shit like that. You know, <laughs> That's great. You know, and okay, I can see that there's, there's some sort of pull behind that because it's great to motivate people to do stuff, to get off their asses. But on the other hand, like, there are way too many people that push themselves a little bit too hard and fuck things up for a long time. And if fitness is about a baseline of wellness, then why are we... Why are we impeding our wellness by training ourselves into injury? And Pavel, for such a hardcore guy, former Soviet special operations instructor, to be able to say, like, don't train like that. Don't push yourself to the point where you're broken. Leave two quality reps in the bank for every set. It was like, wow, mind-numbing. Yeah, that that blew my mind. He talks about that in Easy Strength. And uh, really looking at what you do as a practice rather than exercise, Right. Because whatever you're practicing is something that you're building upon. So you practice the movement of a squat or a hinge 
or, or fill in the blank, rotational, you, you know, any of these practices are just that. And even if you have goals to get stronger, the more often you can practice, the better, right? But if you beat yourself up, whether you're, you know, somebody that's sedentary that was told by the doctor, hey, you should try weight training or you should lift or, or get out in nature more or do anything activity wise, we have the tendency to go all in, you know? And so that's when people who are not used to that get hurt. And even at the highest level of, of athletics, you look at how many guys get hurt in the UFC all the time still. And it's because of the fact that people still have that old school bust your ass instead of leaving two reps in the tank and, and using it as a practice. And the more consistent you can stay with a practice, the better you're going to get because you're training the nervous system just as much as you're training the muscle itself. But if you're not mindful of the nervous system, that's when you're going to run into issues. Absolutely. I mean, you just nailed the you just nailed it right on the head. I mean, we're so prone to wanting to go all in so we can devote ourselves to something so we can concentrate. But oftentimes we go so far all in that we tune out. And the moment that we tune out mentally, that we lose that kind of awareness of what are the important things that we need to do in this practice rather than just the physical exercise, we lose the awareness of the totality of what we're doing. We lose the experience. We lose the richness of that experience. And so when we lose the richness of that experience, then we're just that hamster on the wheel, like mindless. Moving our bodies, but no real engagement, which is part of the reason why like K3 to me was such a, a big like shift in paradigm. I wanted people to be able to move, to continuously move, but never be disengaged. They always have to be on. And in a reactive environment, when you've got to react to a stimulus, you can't tune out. Like if we're playing catch and I'm just kind of tuning out and like not, not really looking at you, like odds are pretty good I'm either going to miss the ball or be beaned by it. Either way, right? I'm going to fail at the exercise or it's just going to, it's going to take on a different kind of angle. With the K3 stuff, whether it's the empty hand stuff, whether it's the strength training stuff, whether it's the implement based stuff, everything is reactive. So when we're working with uh, an object with that first K, we're talking about kettlebells, which I've expanded to mean more than just any kettlebell. Like it can be any strength training implement, like whether a mace, whether a steel bell, whether whatever, right? So one of the things that we were doing on day one was playing catch with a steel bell and throwing it around a circle. So we have like, let's say eight to 10 people in a circle playing catch with a couple of steel bells. Well, what are they all doing when that, the, the circle's that big to be able to catch and then to project the steel bell? Hinge. So what does that look like? It's like a micro swing but then not using a kettlebell. So you're practicing that hinge mechanics on a ballistic object and being able to decelerate and accelerate. But then again, you have to do it in a reactive environment. So the brain, the intent is always there. Yeah, you're keeping people engaged. That was something that I noticed yesterday too when we got to the implements with the sticks was, and it's something that I had forgotten large part. Now, maybe I didn't fully grasp it when I first started with it in 2006, but it had been since 2008 since I had worked with the sticks and I had thought, you know, right now, this is, and this is something I told you afterwards, this is one of the best meditations I've had in months because you're engaged, but there's a part of me that would, would just, it just dropped. It just dropped the monkey mind. It dropped the noise. And <clears throat> thankfully through my experience in martial arts, it's not something where if I miss or mess up that I'm going to beat myself up over. And you talk quite a bit about that, you know, like, you know, don't say sorry while you're training because it just wastes time. Right. And we have a goal. We have a place to get to the second you stop to apologize, you're now delaying getting to that goal. Yep. But that was something that was that, that I thankfully didn't have to grapple with. I could just keep going. And it's fun when you really can't and just, shift gears and pick right up where you left off and continue to go through that. But I mean, I was, I felt amazing afterwards because I was like, damn dude, like this, I feel so much peace and so meditative and I'm breathing through my nose the whole time. And <clears throat> I don't think it, you know, what was cool too, is in showing up late, I was trained by everybody who had been there to get the movement patterns down. And they were the coaches for me, you know, alongside you and all those people could teach it well enough for me to be able to pick up right where I left off 12 years ago. That's way cool. You know, to, to address that point of meditation, just like our friend Peter Crone had talked about, um, in one of the podcast episodes that he's done, he talks about the distinction between meditation and meditative. 
Um, and I think a lot of us associate meditation with we got to go into a room, we got to sit down on a cushion, got to light some incense, got to chant a, like some kind of sutra or something to be able to just get into that groove, get into that kind of zen out space. And while that is one interpretation of meditation, it's different when you can make aspects of your life meditative, where the exercise or the thing that you're doing, whatever you're engaged in, is automatically bringing you to that zen out state. And especially when you can do it in concert with other people. Like when you don't have to like go away or isolate yourself from everyone else, but you can be in the thick of things and then still in the groove, that's a special level of dope. So with K3, one of the ideas that I was that I that you touched on just now was like the don't say sorry. So I have a drill called the road rage drill. Um, we went over on day one, and it's one of the things that I use with the U.S. speed skating team um, when I was working with them. One of the coaches was telling me, "Hey, Doc, you know, uh, you know, speed skating, believe it or not, is in some ways kind of a contact sport, right? If people get bumped, they could get disqualified." You know, or if, if rather, if they're doing the bumping, they could get disqualified. If they get bumped, it could throw them, they could slip, whatever. It's like, it's very hard to keep your mind in the game or in the race when sometimes you get bumped and that could totally throw you off. And he goes, you got anything for that? I go, shit, yeah, I got something for that. <laughs> so I had everyone get in a room and like two lines. And I said, look, I want you guys to walk from that end of the room to this end of the room and walk through this these two lines. And as you walk along those two lines, people are going to push you. Like, not like deck you out the window, but push you and shove you and, and kind of distract you. You can either be locked into that moment of the distraction, you can either get frustrated by it, you can tense by it, or you can relax and keep walking towards your goal point. So if you think about it, that's road rage, right? The moment you get pissed off on the road, like that motherfucker cut me off or whatever, right? The moment you get upset about that, 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 that distraction from the stimulus, you're not engaged in the act of driving anymore. You're locked up in that moment in the past. And the moment you're locked up in that moment in the past, you are not reacting to the stimulus that's in front of you. You're not engaged in the act of driving as optimally conscious because your mind, your heart, your emotions, your aggression is geared towards something that has already gone by. And odds are pretty good that the person that like cut you off or that like did whatever already doesn't give a shit and has moved on. But you're still locked up in that moment in the past. So the road rage drill was designed so that like people could then be exposed to those noxious stimuli and practice letting go. Like it's not important. I got to go there. And just repeating that kind of mindset. It's not important. I got to go there. Oh, I missed a contact point or I missed a technique or I missed a movement. It's not important. I got to go there. So having that ability to let go of those moments where we quote unquote screw up, need to apologize, need to somehow make a, a, a compensation for it. Really the best compensation, the best apology is just making sure that the future is better. That's huge. Yeah, It, it really is. I mean, think about all of the things that we see on social media about how like, the best apology is changed behavior. It's really true. Like saying I'm sorry doesn't do shit. Really doesn't. Especially how often that word is misused. Like if you actually tell someone I'm sorry, but then you actually ensure more than just the words I'm sorry, ensure that your behavior in the future is more on point, more dialed in, that's rich. Yeah. Yeah. And that obviously, you know, people, the analogy is perfect because you're using that in the, in the road rage example. And of course, <clears throat> you know, reading the happiness hypothesis, that's where most Americans have their, their most disgruntled time of day is in traffic. But thinking about that outside, just in terms of our goals, how many times do you have your eye fixed on the goal and something takes you a little off course? And then that becomes the fixation point. Right. Yep. Like oh, I'm preparing for a jujitsu tournament, and now I just tore my knee in a, with an inside heel hook, and and then that becomes the focus. The woe is me. My knee is torn. How long is this going to take to fix? And you lose sight of the goal that you were training for to begin with. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case is. And in cases like that, let's say when you're training in the face of injury, a lot of times injuries. You know, people hate to hear this phrase, but I think it's true. Sometimes when we get sidetracked, those are blessings in disguise because sometimes the, the sidetracking frees up time for you to do something else. So let's say I, for example, myself, when I got back from the Winter Games, I was jet lagged as fuck. 
and I took my kids, my, uh, my kids were enrolled in Taekwondo. And so like I, that was my time with them, you know, because I don't get to see them all the time between their, their mom's house and my house. So I was like, I just got back from a month away in Korea. I'm dying to spend time with my kids. Okay, we'll go to Taekwondo training. And like, I was totally smoked, went in there in a sparring night, of course, jet lagged. And I'm like, my feet aren't underneath me, end up really severely spraining my ankle. And so um, part of me is like, fuck, I sprained my ankle. This is great. I'm going to have to take time off of training. But then when you can't use that ankle, that frees up time for you to do a whole bunch of other things that you'd been sidelining elsewhere. So looking at, or rather, find, rather than looking at, trying to find ways or learning to find ways where you can see where there's an opportunity that's presenting itself because now you can't do something else that you originally prioritized that in and of itself, I think, is a skill that we need to practice as well. Yeah, that's a huge skill. It remind, and I know I've probably quoted this way too often, but Aubrey, when he talks about using hindsight as foresight, you know, whatever challenge that we've had in the past, if we're here talking about it today, that means we got through it, right? Mm -hmm. And so whatever the stress or whatever the challenge, that's the thing that, that got us here today that may, in some ways, in many ways, likely made us better by having gone through that stressor, right? You don't get stronger just squatting the bar. You gotta add weight to it. You need a new stressor. You need to change the dynamics of the motion in some way that's challenging. And through the challenge, that's where growth occurs. So if you can use hindsight, knowing all the times in the past where that benefited you as foresight when you're in the eye of the hurricane right now, then it's a lot easier to be like, hmm, I can't see how this will benefit me, but I know that it will, and this is happening for me, not to me. Mm -hmm. One, another important point right, right in there is talking about how you can be doing the same old stuff, right? But just a little bit of variation oftentimes is the stimulus you need to be able to reapproach that same old thing in a way that's new and beneficial and fresh. So like one of the things that we were doing with one of our drills with K3, the double implement drills, double stick drills, was we took a, a drill called the 24 count. And then we'd vary, we'd vary it. Like for the, your listeners that are familiar with Kali, um, you've, most of you guys have heard of Heaven Six. Um, it was one of the drills that you were, you'd done before with a, just a six count drill um, in the double stick. There's so many ways of skinning that cat with Heaven Six, even though it's there's six beats all at the high line. You can do forward grip, you can do inverted grip, you can use one stick just to answer all six beats. You can break back and forth. So it's like so much variation that can still keep that drill super rich. So let's say you're working with a partner that's only that's barely learned how to do heaven six, but they can manage to keep it together. Once they're at that point where they can keep it together and handle that, then you can now change the stimulus for them to still make it unique, novel, and beneficial. Like the three things I talk about a lot of times in K3 programming are, is what you're doing beneficial? Is it challenging? And is it fun? If it's not those three things, then why the fuck are you doing it? You know, that's not training. That's like testing. Like, you, let's, let's see how well you endure some shit. But if it's training, like, why not create everything in that training environment that's a eustress, right? Something that brings out a better response, like a beneficial adaptation rather than a compensation. So as, as we're doing that heaven six drill, right? Like, you're in your groove. You're practicing that inward back and back and inward back and back and inward back and back in. So as we're doing as you're doing that, maybe I get to practice, all right, I'm going to flip and invert. So now it presents a different visual stimulus to you. You've got to stay on track with that. I get to practice a different coordination pattern and we both benefit. You know, so there's that scalability aspect. Everyone can come to the drill and still be fed. Yeah. Yeah, it's so massive. And you've had, I mean, just in looking at the group, you had people that were, some of them personal trainers, some of them working, um, you know, in corporate wellness, keeping people that are mostly sedentary at desk jobs all day long in cubicles mm -hmm. active and, you know, all the way to different professional athletes and, and martial artists all training there and all finding benefit and seeing new ways in which they can bring that to their clientele. Totally. And that, you know, I mean, I think the thing that was really fun for me was the fact that it was so enjoyable. You know, I went from this meditative state where 
I really felt deep peace. And then as we picked it up, I couldn't wipe the smile on my face. You know, like <laughs> it was so, so much fun to add speed as the element now that we had some comfortability there. But I want, I want you to break down. Um, I mean, I want to talk medicine and I also want to talk about really the ways in which you see this benefiting everything from kill kids with developmental issues to, to all aspects, because there's so much more to this training than just, Oh, I'm going to learn how to, how to throw some sticks with somebody. Right. Um, as far as the medicine goes, I think when you look at how much of our sports, how much of our physical pursuits these days allow our bodies to be wound one particular direction, right? Like tennis, golf, um, even baseball, like sports that are like one side dominant, writing, shooting, whatever, right? Like there's so much of, of our lives that allows us to be wound in one direction, allows our fascia, allows our nervous system to be biased in one direction. That's great in the sense of it, it allows the body to find like a very quick expedient pathway. But as far as training, training is about, to me, pushing the envelope of our human experience, pushing the envelope of our human abilities. So if we can push the envelope of our human abilities, why not develop act- develop those attributes on the sides of our bodies that are non-dominant? So when you're in an environment where you have to work each movement on the left just as well as you do on the right, for a lot of folks, you'll see in- insane amounts of brain scramble. <laughs> and they sweat like you have a freezing cold room and people will be sweating buckets. Um, and I think, and as far as in the medical aspect, as well as the fitness aspect of that, I think that's very telling. Like I remember hearing Alan Cosgrove one time say like, what do you think? Uh, I don't can't remember if it was Alan or Greg Cook once said that like, what do you think is the biggest single burner of glucose in the human body? And people were like in the room going, Oh, the glutes, the quads, the pet, they don't just naming off muscles. And he goes, how about your brain? It was like, whoa, central nervous system. So when your nervous system or your brain or your thoughts are totally engaged in the movement and you can't tune out, all of a sudden your metabolic system ramps up. And so that same person that may be able to spend an hour on the treadmill at a fairly decent clip and not really sweating, all of a sudden in doing five minutes of work starts sweating profusely when they're doing something with a negligible load, that's telling you something. That's rich. That's when the body starts reforming itself. Um, and that's also when you see like the body not just remolding itself in terms of a fascial line, but also sometimes in terms of a cosmetic way as well. It's very cool to see. Um, so kids that are often passed by for whatever reason due to learn, quote, labeled as learning disabled, when they're given physical exercises, play, like, hey, let's play these games, but these games are directed. Like, let's work on these stick patterns or work on these games where we're actually just playing touch with these instruments. And they get to develop both left and right sides of the body, both left and right sides of the brain, and you have those pathways myelinated, and you can see the academic scores improve. That's seriously dope. Because a lot of times we think that, okay, martial arts is martial arts, Training is training, fitness is fitness, and, you know, academics is academics. But we are starting to realize more and more these days that sometimes how you fine-tune the brain, sometimes how you approach the brain and optimize the brain is really through the body, through movement. Yeah, that, that to me is something that I've, I've felt from martial arts and I've felt in, in different practices, but it's never really been explained um, from the neurochemical standpoint, you know, a lot of people talk about, I I remember reading this, I forget who put it out, but um, there was a cool study that showed if you train a brain game like luminosity, it makes your brain really good at what? Brain games, Mm -hmm. nothing else. There's no (laughs) crossover. You become a master of word puzzles or brain games or any fill in the blank. Okay. If you learn music or a second language, that creates enough cross flow and connectivity in the brain that you actually get smarter everywhere. Huh. And the same without question is true of the body. When you start training both systems, including the weak hand, you get smarter everywhere. And that's something that I think is not as well known, but for any who has experienced it, you understand like I see improvements 
everywhere as I develop these systems because you're training what? The central nervous system. You're training it in a way where it's completely engaged through movement patterns. And, you know, our buddy Aaron Alexander talks about this in, uh, in his recent book. What, what is it, Giles? Align? I think the Align method? Yeah. yeah. That's out now. Get it. Phenomenal. Talks a lot about posture and different movement patterns. But, you know, to your point, like it's, it's something that, that you've seen directly with children who, who really don't have a shot with our current standard of care. And you've seen these vast improvements. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. We get to see it with people that have, have been suffering from TBI, from stroke. What's really crazy is that like you got someone that's doing stroke rehab, have them doing these exercises for fun or have them doing these exercises for rehab. And all of a sudden, like memories start coming back to them. Mm. And that's, that's really powerful. And I'd love to be able to win the lottery and fund a ton of these studies. But until then, we've got this anecdotal evidence that's very powerful and suggests that there's so much that so much benefit that we're leaving on the table. Um, it's interesting too because, like, we talk about in in the in the functional movement systems paradigm, we talk about asymmetry as a predictor for injury or something that might impair performance. So if you look at asymmetry, I, I break it down to more than just asymmetry from left and right. I think I like as I teach, I talk about five asymmetries: first one, left, right second one anterior posterior third one top bottom fourth one medial lateral fifth one internal external so let's say you're doing an exercise that's very top heavy meaning like very hand oriented right and then all of a sudden you get really good at that but then like you have to add in the feet and then watch brains just melt down right <laughs> because now you have to instead of just thinking about symmetry right the, are the feet as capable as the hands let's think about let's swap out the word coordination for symmetry are left and right coordinated? Are anterior and posterior coordinated? Are top and bottom working in sync? Are they coordinated? You know, medial lateral working in symphony, right? Internal and external. Is who you are on the inside the same as what you look like outside cosmetically? Like those kinds of things, that kind of congruency. So as we're working these skills, as we're working these practices, your left hand, your right hand, favoring like one of the things that we did on day one was I had everyone take a right lead while we're doing some of these drills, like let's say the 24 count. And people are like, okay, cool, got this, no problem. Okay, great, switch leads. Same hand starts, just switch leads, meltdown. <laughs> and then the moment they got pretty good at that left lead, and you go back to right, the right is even better. Symmetrical, even better. So it's like when you put people in a position of gentle discomfort where they can explore and then allow them the time and give them the chance to become comfortable competent and confident man what a change what like an overall improvement you see across the board yeah i want you to expand upon that because that's that's one of the principles that you're uh, known for is this training slow mm -hmm. training slow because you create an environment that's easier to learn in and then from there you can pick up the pace i think i got that from my dad i honestly i think the roots of that whole training slow thing probably started for me as a kid like my dad was one of my first martial arts teachers um, and exposed me to Tai Chi. And I remember like as a kid listening to my dad talking about Tai Chi and Tai Chi training principles. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. And like typical, typical, uh, you know, American raised kid. And then as I grew older and especially through my own experiences and my own research, especially in the field of sports performance and human performance, I'm like, holy shit, everything that almost everything that my dad has taught has said to me since like I was 10 was spot the fuck on and it's mind numbing and like tell him now like now that he's visiting me in LA and staying with me like I tell him all the time and I apologize to him I get debt which I shouldn't be apologizing I should just thank him <laughs> I go dad thank you so much you know like you know everything that you said to me back in the day like it was gold like it's taken me 30 40 years to figure it out but yeah it was seriously gold so thank you for that um the slow thing is huge because if you think about what we do to improve awareness of a situation in movement, what do we automatically do anytime it's in sports? Anytime, let's say we just watched a UFC fight. We want to know better. We want to better understand, better have a grasp of what just happened. What do we automatically do? Watch a slow-mo replay, right? 
Because sometimes in real life, even if you're sitting there ringside, even if you're the ref in the cage, because of your perspective, because of whatever, right? You may not have been able to fathom all of the details of what just went down. So when you've got the ability to play things back in a slow-mo setting, you can then examine it from different perspectives and go, oh, shit, I didn't catch that before. Like, oh, wow, there's a detail that I missed before. And when you can slow things down like that, something that seems utterly common and mundane, you can then examine it from different perspectives in a way that, like, I say with Tai Chi, right? Tai Chi, I've been involved with that since I was, like, 10. Like, I'm almost 50 now. So, like... For me, Tai Chi is one of those things that no matter how many times I practice it, I train it, I examine it, it's never held the light the same way twice. It's like a really well-cut diamond. And I think any pursuit, and certainly with K3, the whole idea was to be able to make it like that. You can take a drill or a series of drills or a series of principles. And if you are able to modulate the speed and generate greater awareness or create an environment where the awareness can be deepened, you will then be able to have all of these different breakthroughs that because you didn't realize you were leaving shit on the table. You know, so like if I can take this and realize, oh my God, I wasn't breathing there. Oh my God, I was tensing there. Oh my gosh, why am I like, why am I, why is my movement kind of like shaky or off there? These are little points of attention that ordinarily at sports speed or at higher speeds, we're not able to be aware of. So when you can slow things down, then you can see like, ah, okay. I don't need to be tense. I don't need to be amped up. And if I'm still amped up, why am I that amped up? How come I can't downregulate? And in today's world, when we've got this high stim environment, like everything's about like, what's got more caffeine? What's got more of a, of a boost? What's going what's to help me accomplish more? I think all of those are good because yeah, we are, we're, let's face it, we are in a higher output than ever lifestyle. But we also have lost by and large, the skill of downregulating. So having the ability to be able to do that in movement, in our training, and vary the speed, like a dimmer switch, right? Like if you're in a room that's got a dimmer switch, you can amp the light up if you want to do work. You can tone the light down when you want to chill. It's It's a comfortable environment for more than just one thing, right? And so if you can do that in your movement, if you can do that in your training, then you can take that skill and parlay that out to other aspects of your life as well, even in conversation. Yeah, I love that. So, so, so important. Talk a bit about Tai Chi. Uh, it's something that was introduced to me from Paul Cech. Um, as you mentioned, you know, it's one of those things when I practice, it's uh, a unique experience. You know, it's, it's not psychedelic per se, but just like psychedelics, it's new to me every time I do it Mm -hmm. and it's used for different reasons. But I think of, I love tools that can engage us in the down regulation that can calm us, that can help us find our deep inner stillness that are not sitting in a dark, quiet room, which I still do. I still like it, but I just like, I think, I think for, uh, many people, and he talks about this, um, Parathasi talks about this in the Vedanta Treatise, which is one of my favorite all-time books, how the body requires prep before you can sit still. The mind requires prep. The intellect requires prep all before you can achieve the union and bliss that comes from meditation. But I think if we do meditative practices that include the body, then that's a hack for so many people in the West who are go, 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 do, do, do. Yep. It, one of the concepts that I talk about a lot in K3 is point of entry, right? Like if I tell you right off the bat, hey, we're going to do Tai Chi. And for people that are like very active, very like go, go, go. If the first point of access to them doing this kind of meditative work is Tai Chi, it's going to be so slow, it'll bore the pants off them. So how do we break them into that? We have to give them the right point of access, point of entry, right? Um, were you there? Did I? Were you there when I did that Tai Chi move on, at the very at end? At the very end, yeah. Oh, so you were, right? Yeah. Um, to me, that's one of those things that's really powerful. Like just doing that first move, and then actually feeling like, oh my god, my fingers are buzzing. Like I can feel there's blood, like increased blood, or like my hands are sweating. There's a, there's a different kind of vasodilation. That you know, getting people to realize you can control your blood flow. And it's, you know, not something mystical or magical, but just by virtue of becoming aware of your posture, your breath, your tension levels, 
you can then increase blood flow to parts of your body. And for a lot of us, we lack that awareness. We're never exposed to that. And so the first, that first time that you can experience that, especially for people that have stuff like, um, you know, cold extremities, like when they're like, oh, my hands are always freezing. And then they do an exercise like that. And they shift out of that sympathetic nervous system dominant state and allow their body to experience parasympathetics for the first time. It's huge. It's huge. Tai Chi is one of those things that like, I think most people don't understand. They just think about it as like octogenarians in a park, like old Chinese people that can't do <laughs> Kung Fu. They do that shit. Um, and really, if you under, it, like, if you look at it linguistically, Tai Chi means the extremes. So in that sense of the extremes, you need to be able to explore the extremes. That's one of the things, one of the posts I put up on my Instagram. Like you need to be able to explore maximal tension as well as maximal relaxation, maximal disengagement, Mm -hmm. maximal speed, as well as total stillness. And then explore everything on that spectrum in between. Because otherwise, like you're pigeonholing yourself to just a very narrow expression of the human experience. Damn, yeah, so important. That's uh, there's uh, <laughs> when you were when Jay introduced us and, and I knew you were coming to town. It's it's funny how many. I guess there isn't a ton of them. Maybe I can count on one hand, but there have been pretty significant moments post fighting career where I've been introduced to something and I thought, "Fuck, I wish I had this when I was fighting." And as, as anticipated, fuck, I wish I had this when I was fighting. Dude, that know? means the world to me to hear that, man. Really. Yeah, that's, brother. That's, that's deep. I mean, I think Tai Chi, the way I, the way I understand it, the way I've been exposed to it and had the chance to learn it and, and digest it, it's pretty different. I mean, like a lot of folks think about Tai Chi as like there's this classical lineage thing that has to be preserved, move by move, breath by breath line by line, written in Chinese, spoken, blah, 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 blah. But really, like, what's the concept? The concept should be universal. And the concept of Tai Chi should be that, like, A, you're healthy. And the more healthy you get, the more vital you get, the more vigorous you get, the more you can push that envelope to explore the extremes. You should be able to generate tension. You should be able to lift weight. You should be able to move fast. You should be powerful and vital. And you should be able to totally downregulate be chill, be still, and not be antsy, right? Like everything in between should be accessible to you. It should be your right to be able to be comfortable in all of that. And that's Tai Chi. Like the classical moves are useful. They're great. I mean, like when you actually understand them in terms of the combatives, they're actually really cool. Like joint locks, throws, neck cranks, sweeps, like, you know, kicking and punching. Like it's legit. A lot of people don't practice it that way, which makes it kind of like, you know, that sort of McDojo-ish whatever thing. Like, <laughs> McDojo, yeah. Like fake foo, whatever. But I think when you understand it, you take the time to break it down and really understand like the mechanics of combat, but also the principles guiding it. It is so deep and so rich. You know, like Beachbody, the people that put together P90X, asked me to put together a Tai Chi program. Um, which they christened Tai Cheng. Um, and I changed the Chinese character for the Cheng from like what would have been my last name to the Chinese character for like achievement or accomplishment. Mm. So it's like the great accomplishment. Um, the idea with that was to be able to take the best parts of Tai Chi and translate that to a modern audience so that like regardless of who you are, whether you're the octogenarian that just wants to like be able to move a little bit better without pain or you're like the 40 year old who's still vital still exercising and wants to be able to enjoy the vitality of their youth while working with an aging body like let's like let's face it when we hit our 40s shit's different you know we still got enough strength enough power enough like knowledge to be able to do great stuff but we have to moderate we have to modify what we do because we're not 18 anymore um but also too to be able to take that same kind of training method and this was really cool one of the d1 schools told me hey you know what we're doing for our track athletes i go no tell me he goes your tai chang program and don't you breathe a fucking word about that to (laughs) to any of our competition and i thought wow that was really cool so i always wished i could have just said like which school was doing that (laughs) and i still do but anyway um wow 
for injury prevention, for training single leg stance, for training efficiency and movement. That's all in Tai Chi. So a lot of people will look at Tai Chi as like, yeah, I'll do that when I'm old and I can't do anything else. But oftentimes, like being able to downregulate and change the pace, it's just like driving a car. I mean, if you had a car that only goes in fifth gear, like what the hell kind of driving experience is going to be that? You know, like if you can take your car and like, I can move it at any speed comfortably, like I can go into chill mode, I can drive slowly, I can floor it with the best of them. And the driving experience is comfortable and controlled and like enjoyable no matter what. Isn't that human optimization? Isn't that like experiencing the most out of life? Yeah, brother. Well, let's talk um, a little bit more, I guess, in the medicine. Let's talk about pain. Yep. You know, this is a, a conversation I just had recently with Dr. Mike Hart. And, uh, you know, it's, it's brought up. Everyone is aware of the opiate e epidemic. Everybody is aware of what's going on. And, and certainly, I think there's been less overprescribing, but people are still hooked on pain medicine. And one of the things that I think is critical is a reevaluation of how we view pain and how we move through that pain, how we rehab it, and how we don't lean on pharmaceuticals for the rest of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. I think if we were, I say this a lot, but I really wish that kids, our educational system was totally different because right now they're taught, oh, if something hurts, like either go to the school nurse or there's a pharmaceutical intervention for it, right? Like our media is bombarded with like Advil, whatever, you know, like not, not to knock it because it's got its place. Like, let's face it, Western medicine has its place. Surgery has its place. But, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of us don't know any better. And so, like, our default is that, okay, we've got a problem, therefore we have to turn to this. So it's like we're only given that hammer, so now everything looks like a nail. Whereas, like, you may have pain, you may have uh, discomfort, and let's get to the bottom of what that could be. It may be because we didn't rest enough. It may be because we ate too much of something. It may be because, like we overtrain something or we have a dysfunctional movement pattern. And those are the things that we're not taught to see unless we're like professionals. My feeling on that is like, I would rather be out of a job when it comes to that. Like if I could have all of, all of society know like, all right, I'm experiencing this pain because like I've been overtraining these particular movements. And because I've been overtraining these particular movements, now that's affecting my tissue elasticity or my circulation or causing joint, causing compression in a joint. Like to be able to see that and be able to act on that, that's, that's something that I wish would happen. And I think that really needs to start with our education system. Like we've got an education system that's f fixated on brokenness. Like, oh, you're broken, here's a solution. And it's, and it's a ready-made solution rather than like, let's retrain how you live so that you are not broken. Yeah, diving into that, it's like a um, a certain degree of self inquiry, right? Like you have to you have to be able to have enough knowledge to where you can look and see, like, oh, maybe this is repetitive stress. Of course, if you don't have that ability, thankfully there are people like you in the world. But you know, we really do. We give away our personal power because we're taught it's almost like a programming you know we talked talked about this with uh peter crone and, and with bruce lipton my apologies the bruce lipton episode was lost it'll be regained at a different at a different point in time but um that programming we have from the third trimester till we're seven years old because our brain state is is theta it's it's ready to receive the programs and we're programmed in a in a myriad of ways but one of the first ways we're programmed is we go to the doctor anytime we need help. They're the expert. We go to the doctor for the checkup. We go to the doctor when we're sick. We go to the doctor for everything. So why would that change when you're older? That's the expert who, who has the golden key to your health. It's almost like, and this is not, not to shit on any one particular religion, but you know, you go to the priest to confess and the priest can relay the message to God. And he's the mediator who holds the fucking key to you. You're getting into heaven as opposed to I have this connection to myself and I, I can ask and think outside the box and I can look. All you have to do is look and see 
Western medicine has many benefits. And I said this before, I had a labrum tear in my right shoulder. The best surgery got my shoulder working again. It's non-preventative. It's not working for preventative health. It's not working to teach us how to live better so we don't need to go to the doctor, right? And I think that's, that's one of the key missing ingredients. But with that program from a young age of they're the expert, we don't think of ourselves as somebody who can become knowledgeable, who can learn the way our body works or find people outside of what our insurance covers that may totally. know more. Right? Totally. Actually, we're, I think we're programmed to break ourselves. I'll say that. I think we're programmed by society. We're programmed by the media. We're programmed by like our peers to break ourselves. Go hard or go home. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you concentrating? Push harder. Give me more. Lay it all out in the field. Leave it all in the gym. What if we're programmed to listen to our bodies and to actually pay attention to where we're not functioning well or challenged by exercises that put us outside of our comfort zones or put us outside of our favorite pet lifts? Like Monday's International Bench Day. Damn you if you work on your legs or some <laughs> shit. You know, like, come on. Like, what if we did things that actually forced us to constantly be more aware of our inventory of movement and our health rather than just pushing hard? Oh, you got to push hard because that's that's the measure of how much you're you're really devoting to this life. Maybe the measure of how much you're devoting to this life is how much joy you yourself are experiencing. You know, Hicks and Gracie, I think, one time, if I recall correctly, during one of his episodes, interviews with Joe, Joe Rogan, Joe was asking him something about, like, you know, what's important in life to Hickson. And Hickson was like, you know, my friend, it's, it's very simple. Are you happy? Are you healthy? Are you horny? To me, like, that, that it sounds kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's very true. Like, human beings these days spend so much freaking money and energy on trying to figure out, like, how can I have more sex? Dude, what if you just rested and listened to your body, ate well, didn't push yourself to do all this crazy shit, and actually took the time to communicate with the other person that you wanted to be down with? Do you think that would add to a better intimate environment? Of course it would. But no, nah, we don't want to do that. We want to just like go run through everything else. And so we're running away from our problems. And a lot of it is just because we've been miseducated to do so. Yeah, it's this, uh, it's the focus on the external, right? The shiny object you don't have, uh, the, the extra half an inch you can get from the boner pill, <laughs> whatever it is. That these, shit doesn't work. It does I've not been told. work. <laughs> I've tried them all. Um, you know, we, we, look, chinking. we look external. We look to, for these external sources of happiness instead of internally. And part of that is there's a discomfort. And this is me speaking from my own personal experience and uncomfortability in my own skin. I had for many years. And seeking that elsewhere outside of myself rather than truly trying to know myself and getting into the inner workings and paying attention to the lowest level of anxiety. Hmm, I feel a slight level of anxiety. Where's the source of that? But we've been taught to run away from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like how often have you been taught as a kid, like, okay, what makes you anxious? What makes you feel insecure? What makes you feel unsafe? What makes you feel less than? What makes you feel like scared? Let's examine that. Normally we're taught, oh, don't worry about that. You have no reason to feel that. So we're invalidated. Peter talks a lot, a lot about that in his work. And I think that's something that we would all do better as a society, delving deeper into. But if we were able to train, able to look, able to be comfortable inquiring about that, and then learning to converse about that in a kind of accurate language, man, how much we would evolve. Like most people, like most couples I see, have a hard time getting down to really talking about what's important to them because they don't want to be judged. Yeah, like one person doesn't want to be judged. It's the hard conversation that everyone avoids. And it doesn't have to be the hard conversation. You know, I mean, that's, that's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read on relationship was nonviolent communication mm. because you, it's, it's, it's a, it's a program on how to speak with compassion. And at the end of the day, when I communicate with somebody, the best communication is where I'm heard and where I hear you and understand you. Right. Totally. We're not just talking to each other. I can listen and then I can reframe it in a way that lets you know, I understand you. And if I'm off, we continue the conversation 
until we're both heard. So back to that point, which I think is beautiful, or back to the point of K3 and that and tying that in. Like as we're working, did you notice that when we're working through the lines and then like in the group exercise setting or in the group training setting, one of the things that we were doing was like you work at the speed of your partner, right? So like make it as simple and accessible as your as your partner needs. And at the same time, like confront your own impatience. Like that was one thing I said quite a lot of on day one. I don't think I said it on day two um, because it was so drilled in. And I think people actually got that. But you're trying to figure out a way to improve the level of your training partner, whoever you're working with in that round. But you're also trying to confront your own impatience and trying to figure out how to improve your own technique, how to improve your own posture, how to improve your own diction and communication. So like the training is multi-layered there. Like you're never just trying to like vomit at someone whether in movement or in word but all, always trying to figure out where are they and that kind of awareness allows you to like listen in a tactile way in a visual way and also an auditory way yeah that's incredible well this is making me think about kids i know we talked about a little Dude. bit about this last night um patience is such a critical piece when you're a parent you know it's, it's absolutely critical and i think um you know, Gabby Reese told me this once when we were in her sauna and she was talking about how the problem we have with our children is that we think wherever they're at in life, that that's where they're going to be as an adult if we don't fix it. Right. So damn, but that's that, heavy. but that's not, that's heavy. That's, but that's never the case because kids at fucking adults, we all go through phases. We all go through a phase where we try this new thing out and we see how well it works. And as a parent, we think it's all on us to curtail a behavior that maybe won't fit in with a larger group. Right. But guess what? They're also a part of a larger group. They have school, they have teachers, they have coaches, they have all these other influences that also shape them. Mm -hmm. So it's not all on you, right? And if I think if we exercise patience and a deeper understanding and awareness that our kids are going to be influenced by everybody, for better or worse, that those things do have a way of writing themselves as they grow older. But to that, I just want to say, like, where do you see, I mean, what are, what are some of the principles that you've used with your kids? Your kids are in martial arts. Obviously, as a dad, I'm sure you've taught them a great deal of the wisdom that you have through K3 and your lessons and, and from your dad with Tai Chi. I'm sure that there's been exposure to everything. How well do, have they gravitated towards those things and where have they pushed back? I've been really lucky. You know, like I've had the chance to expose my kids to martial arts from the cradle, right? They grew up in, like, when their mom and I were still married, they grew up in a house where, like, the living room was basically a dojo. It was matted out, like, surrounded by weapons. Like, nothing was baby-proofed. I mean, the baby-proofing was sort of like, at least for my daughter, right? At that time, my, my daughter's baby proofing consisted of like being on the mat. So if she fell, she could just like fall on the mat rather than like hardwood floor. Um, and it's funny because like speaking of that and not having to child proof or baby proof things. When my son, I think was in first grade or kindergarten or something like that, he had some schoolmates over, you know, to do some homework. And once they were done homework, I said, yeah, you guys can go in the living room and play. And there's like sword, sharp swords, spears, all that kind of shit all over the place, right? And the kids are like, oh, this is awesome. And they went to go grab it. And he's like, uh, you need to put that down. So like he regulated without me having to say a thing, which is kind of cool. Like when you look at how you educate kids and how you take the time to inform them about stuff, and then they're aware of what the concept is. They're aware of what the realities are. They're aware of what the liabilities are. And then they can then inform others, their peers, which is kind of dope. So to answer your question, as far as my kids, like, and how they've been gravitating towards stuff there, it's really cool. Like I can, I can tease them away from their devices, tease them away from their iPhones, tease them away from their iPads, tease them away from Netflix or whatever like that. And go like, Hey, let's, let's train, let's play. And they're usually down to do it unless they're just way physically beat from the day before or they're under the weather. But um, more often than not, they're cool. They're like, yeah, let's go play. Like I've converted my, my garage to basically a dojo. Like if you look on my Instagram, like the majority of the stuff that I have going on at home, it, it's in that room. And it, it looks like 
man cave par excellence, minus like the massage chair, which one of these days I'll get. <laughs> Probably not in that room, but you know, Olympic level judo mats and stuff like that. So it's, it's a great place to train in. And so the kids get to play there. And that play is an exploration of movement, exploration of skills, exploration of coordination. So it's like if my daughter sees something on TV that she thinks is cool, like let's say she's watching Arrow or like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or some other thing where there's like a cool female, like Ming-Na Wen's character in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right, um, is a great martial artist. And she sees this woman that's like cool, empowered, doing dope shit, and then like she looks at it and goes like, oh, dad taught me how to do that. And then there's a buy-in. Then she wants to do more of it. Um, same thing with my son. Like when my son is is like, you know, just as as his a lot of his friends are, they're like on their devices. They want to play games, you know, play Fortnite, do whatever. But if I go, hey, man, like let's work on some like some stick or knife disarms. Let's do some stuff like that. And then he like watches TV and gets to see like, hey, I recognize that pattern. Oh, he did a disarm off of an angle one. And like, he can thin slice it like that. There's an excitement to doing more of it. So it builds. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. What have you seen in them in terms of how they cope with the, I don't know what their ages are. What, how are My they? son is 13. So he's in that kind of getting a little bit salty age group. Uh -huh. um, and then my daughter's seven. So she's still in that like okay. cutesy little girl bit. Yeah. So, so for, for your son, who's a bit older and now stepping into his teenage years, how do you see martial arts helping him in terms of finding his quiet center as opposed to being so caught up with the external that we all remember from junior high and high school? Yeah, I, I think a lot of the, the benefit for him in this is that he's understanding that there can be stressors placed on him that he doesn't have to react to. I think that's a big thing in martial arts. Like you can choose to react and you feel like I have the option of reacting because like whatever you're saying, whatever you're doing physically, you're pushing on me. I can, like, it doesn't pose a threat to me. Like my dad threw a tie kick at me and I had to deal with it, you know, or like I've dealt with like having swords flying at me doing these drills. Like you pushing me, you mouthing off at me doesn't mean shit. So there's a different level of comfort in your own skin when you know you've dealt with potential quote unquote threat that's way higher than anything that most of your classmates are going to bring. So that, I think, is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, he still has a little bit of a temper, which is, you know, part and parcel of, I think, a red-blooded young man. But, you know, I think it's, it's something that he's got a little bit of a handle on. As far as my daughter, one of the coolest things I'll say is this. Whenever I get the chance to drop her off at school, um, and before she goes into the gate, I'll like throw a fake punch at her or something like that. And she'll be like, pop, 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 pop. And it'll be like just something out of like Yip Man. And she'll like, you know, she'll she'll perk up, stand up really straight, smile, give me a big hug. And like all the parents are looking at me like, oh, fuck, how can we don't do that? Or how can we don't have something like that? <laughs> um, and so that's kind of, that's, that's a cool moment. I mean, like just to have your little girl, you know, a lot of people are focused on making their girl, little girl really pretty, really dainty, really whatever. And it's like, for me, she'll have plenty of years to explore all that. You know, like, let me give this child some confidence, feel good about herself, feel like she can stand up straight and then, like, no one's going to mess with her. Not like she's got to carry a chip on her shoulder or any weirdness like that, but just, like, she's good in her own skin. She has nothing to fear. She has, like, a skill set to be excited about. She knows her dad loves her. You know, she gets, she's not afraid of, like, showing physical affection She's also not afraid of like standing her, like, you know, standing her ground and establishing her boundaries. And she knows that she can do it. So like that's, I think that's one of the things that stands out in my mind as far as benefits for my daughter. Yeah, that's huge, brother. It's, it's dope. It's really dope. I mean, to, I, there's never been a morning, honestly, there's never been a morning that I haven't dropped my daughter off at school where like I walk away and I'm not grinning. I mean, that's, I just like, I've noticed that so many times like i don't always get to drop her off at school depending on like you know what this custody schedule is with her mom but on those mornings that i get to drop her off at school like she goes into the gate smiling skipping on her way and like always happy and the teachers have even commented to me about that they're like hey man you know when you drop her off she's like her energy is so awesome 
She's got the glow. She does. She does. And then I do too, by default. Like of course. I'm grinning. I'm like, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I don't know how to, I don't know how to verbalize it. I just feel like I'm walking on, on air. Yeah. I think that through our kids is the truest act of compersion, you know, where their happiness is our happiness. No For sure. about it. For sure. Well, where can people find you online? Where can people find you on the gram? All that good stuff. Um, my social media handles are all uniform. It's at Dr. Mark Cheng. That's D-R-M-A-R-K-C-H-E-N-G. Um, and I have my website, drmarkcheng.com. But mostly like social media, like so through Facebook, Twitter, Insta. Um, and I'm probably most active on Insta for sure. Cool, brother. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the honor of being here, man. And thank you again for making the time both yesterday and today. You got it, brother.